months. And uh, yeah, so it's a pleasure to have him here today. So please, Sam, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much, Guillermo. And thanks for inviting me to come and talk. And I'm sorry that I couldn't make it up to Queensland to be there in person. Today, I'm going to talk to you about Platonism and intramathematical explanation. So I've got uh, one general aim, and the general aim is to present an argument for the existence of mathematical objects. Uh, I'm just going to assume Platonism as the account of mathematical objects for the time being, but strictly speaking, the argument isn't actually going to rely on Platonism very much, but we can just use Platonism as our sort of go going assumption for how we think about mathematical realism. Now, although I'm going to be presenting the argument and defending it, the argument itself I think is really interesting because I think if the argument fails then it actually shows us something interesting either about explanation or about ontology about the way we think about objects and the relations between them and so I'm in, interested in the failure of the argument just as much as its success and so one of the things I'll be doing is showing you some ways out of the argument and sort of identifying the uh, the costs of those ways out the, of, the, of the sort of options and showing that something that um, someone endorses or many people endorses got to go pretty much no matter what you say about this argument. So the argument I think is a kind of curiosity for that reason. But I am a mathematical realist and so I also take this to be an argument in favour of mathematical realism and one of the interesting things about the argument is it's distinct I think to existing arguments for realism. All right, so I'm going to start by giving you a bit of background to the debate. I don't expect that everyone will be familiar with the ongoing debate about mathematical realism, particularly the sort of ins and outs of the debate over the last 20 or 30 years. So I'll give you a bit of that background and show you where the argument that I'm giving you uh, sort of enters into that debate. Then I'm going to outline the argument and give you a defense of the premises. And then, as I said, I'm going to look at some ways of avoiding the argument and the implications of those ways of avoiding the argument. All right. So the bit of the background. So I'm going to draw this distinction between Platonism and nominalism. So mathematical Platonism is the view that mathematical objects exist and that they're abstract objects. As I said, there are other forms of realism, but it's Platonism that I'll focus on today. Nominalists deny the existence of mathematical objects. There are lots of ways to be a nominalist, but they're all united in their um, dislike for the ontological commitment that Platonism has. Now, the central argument for Platonism at least in the last uh, 30, 30 years or so has been the indispensability argument. The indispensability argument draws on the role that mathematics plays in science in order to make a case for Platonism. And the very, very rough idea behind the indispensability argument is that you should believe in mathematical objects for more or less the same reason that you believe in any kind of unobservable entity within the context of your best scientific theories. So for instance, we believe in the existence of uh, black holes, although you might think it's controversial as whether those are observable now or not, but let's just assume for the, for the time being, they are unobservable. We believe in them because they do certain kinds of work within our scientific theories. We, you know, they play an explanatory role, for one thing, and I'll ret return to that in a bit, but also, you know, we quantify over them in the context of general relativity. We may even need them for various mathematical reasons when we're studying the field equations. Uh, and so we believe in their existence because of that central role that they play. The thought is that mathematical objects also play a central role in our scientific theories, and so we should believe in their existence as well. Despite the fact that mathematical objects being abstract entities are unobservable because they're not spatiotemporally located and they don't have any causal properties. Now, the debate around the indispensability argument has come to focus on the explanatory power of mathematics within science. So fairly early on in this debate about indispensability, the point was made that not just any indispensability is sufficient for ontological commitment. There are lots of things that are indispensable to our best scientific theories, and we don't believe in their existence. So for instance, if you think about various idealizations like frictionless planes or infinitely deep oceans, which we use in various scientific models, we use those things, but we nonetheless deny that they exist and we don't feel any pressure to believe in their existence merely in virtue of their indispensability. So what this has done is shifted the focus onto explanatory power. So the, the thought is, well, look, maybe not just any kind of indispensability is important for ontological commitment, but explanatory power is important. And this 
uh, focus on explanatory power comes from the existing connection between scientific realism and explanation. So sort of independently of the debate on indispensability, there's a debate about how to be a scientific realist and about the basis for scientific realism. And that debate comes to focus on inference to the best explanation as a core uh, aspect of the scientific realist position. So the thought is that um, if you want to be a scientific realist, or, or rather the best argument for scientific realism is that the success of science is best explained by our scientific theories being true or the things that we quantify over science, quantify over in our scientific theories existing. And so if you're a scientific realist, you have this standing commitment to there being a really tight connection between explanation and ontology. And so what the sort of most recent round of the indispensability argument has done is come to focus on that connection between realism and explanation and use it in order to establish the existence of mathematical objects. So the thought is that you might deny that, that something exists even though it's indispensable, but you'd better not deny that it exists if it's explanatorily indispensable because explanation and scientific realism go hand in hand. And scientific realism here is sort of assumed as a um, common ground commitment between the Platonist and the nominalist. You can, of course, avoid, I think, all versions of the indispensability argument by being a scientific anti-realist, but this most recent uh, sort of uh, epicycle of the debate is really between two different kinds of scientific realists, those who want to believe in mathematical objects and those who don't. All right, and this has led to a flurry of activity around this thing called extra mathematical explanation. And this is the explanation of physical facts by mathematical ones. So people are looking into science, they're identifying examples where mathematics is playing an explanatory role and it's explaining things outside of mathematics. And they're using those, as, those examples as a basis for running this kind of indispensability argument. So, you know, they're saying, look, mathematical objects do the same kind of explanatory work in our scientific theories as black holes. And so you should believe in them for roughly the same reasons. Okay, so here's just a very brief example um, of a case that gets thrown around a bit in the literature. So consider Darwin's example, uh, Darwin's explanation of why it is that hive bees produce hexagonal honeycomb. And the explanation that Darwin offered was based on a conjecture in mathematics that wasn't proven at the time that Darwin gave the explanation, but had been known for a long time. And the conjecture was that um, if you want to divide a two-dimensional surface up into regions of uh, greatest area with least total perimeter, so you sort of want to make the biggest cells you can with the least amount, um, the, the sort of smallest uh, edge or perimeter that you can, then hexagons are the most efficient shape for doing so. So if, if you're a honeybee and you want to produce nectar storing cells, what you want to do is you want to produce the biggest cells for the least energy expended in uh, making wax. And so you want to make the biggest cells with the smallest perimeter. And so because we've got this conjecture in mathematics that says hexagons are the best way to do that, the thought is that honeybees have kind of evolved to exploit this mathematical claim. And then uh, in 2010, I think it was, the, um, the conjecture was proven for the first time. So it is in fact the case that hexagons are the most efficient way for dividing up a two-dimensional surface. There's lots to say about the honeybees. I don't want to go into too much detail about that today. Uh, this is just to give you a flavor of the kind of thing that people are talking about when they're talking about these explanations. All right, so at the same time that we have this focus on extra mathematical explanation, there's also a rising interest in another kind of explanation, which is uh, which I'm going to call intra mathematical explanation. So this is the explanation of one mathematical fact by another. So this isn't an explanation of a physical fact. These are just explanatory relations between mathematical facts. So the thought is that some proofs within mathematics are explanatory and some are not, or just more generally, there are explanations living inside mathematics, whether they're uh, corresponding to proofs or not. And part of what we're doing in mathematics is actually identifying these explanations because they're useful for mathematical practice and for mathematical discovery and for mathematical understanding. Now, there's a, quite a few people defending the existence of these explanations. Mark Lang's written a a book about the existence of explanations of this kind, where he's trying to develop the general theory. But uh, there hasn't been a much discussion of the relationship between this kind of explanation and mathematical Platonism or mathematical realism. And so the question I'm really interested in is, does explanation of this kind, the intramathematical kind, provide a 
a, a way to argue in favor of realism. And so the argument that I'm going to present today is in fact an argument based on explanation of this kind rather than the extra mathematical case. So just to give you again a flavor of this kind of explanation, here's an, a geometric example. So here's a, an explanatory question you can ask. You can ask why does the line in this uh, trapezoid ML equal the line KN? There are lots of proofs that you can provide of this fact. Um, you know, some of them can just be in virtue of like you just situate it in a Cartesian plane and then do various co coordinate transformations and you can derive the result. Uh, but Mark Lang uh, argues that a sort of good explanation of what's going on here appeals to the symmetry within the figure. So if you look at the symmetry, one thing that's, if you look at the figure, one thing that's notable about it is that it seems to be the same shape twice over in that if you uh, draw a line of symmetry down the middle of the figure that intersects the two bases and intersects the, the point where ML and KN cross, then what you end up with is the same shape sort of reflected across that line of symmetry. And so if you call the point where ML and KN cross O, then what we can do is we can see that MO is going to be the same length as KO, NO is going to be the same length as LO, and so MO plus LN is going to equal M, uh, N, NO and plus KO, and so you're going to end up with um, ML equals KN as a result. So we, what we're doing is we're using the symmetry in the trapezoid to explain why it is that the two lines in the, in the middle there are the same length. All right, so lots of different examples of intramathematical explanation that you can give. Uh, I find geometric examples the easiest to grasp without going into uh, rich detail in the mathematics. So uh, that's why I've given you a case like this, but we can talk about some other cases if you're interested. Okay. So I need one more piece of background. And now this time, uh, the background is about theories of explanation. So setting aside uh, discussions of mathematical explanation in particular or extra mathematical explanation, what I want to do is focus on an extremely popular account of how explanations work in general. So this account says, has sort of two moving parts. One moving part is that explanations are representations. Now what that means is going to vary depending on the particular theory that you're interested in, but usually the idea is that you've got a set of propositions and then you've got some relation over that set of propositions. So for instance, you might have arguments and a relation of consequence over the um, set of propositions in, inside the argument, or you might have models, which are particular kinds of representations and then input output relations between the models. You might have sets of sentences, some kind of representation or, or group of representations and a relation between them. That's what explanations are taken to be. So if you think of the deductive nomological theory of explanation, that's a kind of paradigm case of, of thinking of explanations as represent, representations, because on that view, explanations just arguments, they're just deductive relations between propositions. The backing theory of explanation says that explanations are representations, but in order for a representation to be an explanation, it has to satisfy a further condition. And what that further condition is, is that it must provide information about some mind independent relation connecting parts of the world. So the uh, most, the, the sort of standard example of an, of an account along these lines is a kind of causal theory of explanation. So you might have, for instance, uh, an, the, uh, this idea that explanations are arguments or, or relations between propositions, but it doesn't take much to show that for pretty much any group of representations with a relation over them, pick your favorite relation, there's going to be far more representations that are connected by that relation than you want to count as explanations. And so you generally have to try and rein in the space of those representations that count as explanations somehow. And the, the way that the backing theory proposes to do this is to say, well, it's the explanations that represent relations between things in the world. And those um, are the explanations. And the ones that don't manage to provide information about those kinds of relations between things in the world just don't count as explanations. So here I've got a little picture of how this works. You've got your explanands and your explanandum, which is the, the, the two moving parts of your representation. The explanance is the thing that does the explaining. The explanandum is the thing that you want to explain. And in both of those cases, they might quantify or mention particular kinds of entities. And in order for this sort of representational thing to count as an explanation, that representational thing has to provide you information of a real dependence relation connecting entities. Now, 
the focus for when you sort of go to the early introduction of this kind of picture of explanation was on causation. So the kinds of relations that you would have to find would have to be causal relations. But more recently, there's been uh, a push to liberalize this picture so that you include not just relations of causal dependence, but any kind of relation of dependence between things that can do this kind of work. So you might include causal relations, but also relations like constitution or composition or grounding or uh, lawful dependence or, or um, uh, even certain kinds of conceptual connections. If you think of concepts as things in the world that stand in relations of maybe containment to one another. Okay, so that's this kind of picture of explanation that we've got in the background where I'm going to assume that the backing theory or something like it is right. We'll return a little bit later as to why we should accept this kind of picture of expl explanation. All right, so now I'm going to just going to give you the argument. So here's the argument. The first premise is that there are intramathematical explanations. So there are explanations inside mathematics. The second premise, which comes from the backing theory of explanation, is that all explanations are backed by dependence relations between parts of the world. From there, you get this conditional claim that if there are intramathematical explanations and all explanations are backed by these dependence relations, well, then the parts of the world that are connected by these dependent relations actually exist, and the things that are doing that work in the case of intramathematical explanations are going to be mathematical objects, so we should think that mathematical objects exist, and from there it follows that mathematical objects exist. So the basic idea behind this argument is if you think that all explanations have to be backed by dependence relations between ontological things, like between bits of the world, and you think that there are genuine explanations inside mathematics, well then you're going to have to find some of these dependence relations between things in the world that back those explanations. And so from there, it follows that there's got to be something in the world joined by these things in order for there to be uh, in, joined by dependence relations in order for there to be explanations of the kind that there are claimed to be, namely these intramathematical explanations. All right, so I don't expect you to buy the argument yet. All I've done is present the argument. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to go through each of the premises and I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit in favor of the premises and go through some sort of back and forth with why you might reject the premises. Uh, but then I'm going to turn to, after that, what happens if you start giving up some of these premises? What sort of picture of nominalism or, or um, realism you might be left with? All right, so let's start with this first claim that there are intramathematical explanations. Um, so the basic idea here is that we're just going to defer to mathematicians and mathematical practice in order to provide evidence for this claim. And I think that this is something that we do in the scientific case as well. If we want to make the case that there are explanations within science, what we do is we go and we look at science and we look at the way that scientists operate and the kind of practice that science involves. And we say, well, look, are there ex explanations happening in there? Are people using explanation talk? Are they thinking in terms of explanations? And if they are, then we philosophers just take that as a kind of datum for our philosophical theorizing. And I'll say, I'll say in a moment why we might do that. But first, let's just consider whether there is any evidence of uh, the sort of presence of explanations within mathematics. And actually, there are a few people that are uh, gathering this evidence at the moment. And this is partly because there's been a little bit of debate, just independently of realism, independently of the indispensability argument or anything like that, about whether or not mathematics is an explanatory practice. And so what we have, uh, for instance, is in, in Lang's book, Because Without Cause, he gathers a, a, a range of different um, examples from mathematical historical mathematical texts where mathematicians are reasoning and using explanatory talk in their work. Hafner and Monk, Monk, Mancosu have done a similar thing where they've looked at some textual evidence from uh, a few math, mathematics texts as well and gathered a similar, similar kinds of um, excerpts that show that mathematicians are thinking explanatory terms. But then we've got a couple of other pieces of, of work. So uh, Magia, Ramis et al, they did a corpus analysis, which is a particular kind of linguistic analysis on 5,000 
um, mathematics papers published in the last 10 to 15 years, looking for words like explanation, explains, explanatory, all those sort of cognate terms that we might associate with explanation. And they found that mathematics is just shot through with this kind of talk. So these are professional published articles. They also surveyed mathematicians and asked them to, uh, they were presented with different proofs and asked to identify the explanatory ones. And they found that mathematicians were quite capable of doing that and also that there was a fair bit of convergence amongst mathematicians about which proofs were considered to be explanatory and which which, which ones weren't so all of this is supposed to provide evidence uh, for the view that there are explanations within mathematics not just explanations between mathematical and non-mathematical things okay now can you deny that there are intramathematical explanations i think you can and this is one of the ways out that i'll talk about later on but what I'm going to do is just note the cost of doing that. And I think the cost here is that you end up compromising naturalism in some way, shape or form. So Penelope Maddy, she offers an account of naturalism and her account of naturalism extends to both science and mathematics. So here's what she says about mathematics. She says, mathematics, after all, is an immensely successful enterprise in its own right, older in fact than experimental natural, soci natural science. As such, it surely deserves a philosophical effort to understand it as practiced as a going concern. A philosophical account of mathematics must not disregard the evidential relations of practice or recommend reforms on non-mathematical grounds. So the basic idea here, as with any, I think, appeal to naturalism to ratify a piece of evidence within um, philosophy, is to look at, to compare the, the success of a field with the success of philosophy. So if we compare, for instance, the, su the success of physics or the success of natural science with the success of philosophy, the thought is that science is a much more successful enterprise than philosophy is. And so because of that, we shouldn't allow, we shouldn't make criticisms of science on purely philosophical grounds. Rather, any criticisms of science that we make should come from within science. That doesn't mean that we as philosophers can't make those criticisms, but what we can't do is make them on sort of purely a priori philosophical foundations. And the same sort of reasoning is supposed to apply here to mathematics. So historically, mathematics is an extremely successful enterprise. If we compare mathematics to philosophy, it seems plausible that mathematics is a more successful enterprise than philosophy. And so we should be very careful about recommending changes to mathematical practice or criticizing mathematical practice on philosophical grounds. And if we deny that there are intramathematical explanations and there are all of these mathematicians who are thinking in terms of explanation and thinking in terms of um, explanatory relations between mathematical facts, then we end up um, criticizing in some sense or denying an aspect of mathematical practice. And the worry then is that we're violating naturalism in just the same way that we might violate naturalism when we criticize a scientific theory or an area of science because of purely philosophical reasons. All right, so that's the reasoning behind this first premise. On the one hand, we've got evidence that there are intramathematical explanations. And on the other hand, naturalism pushes us to take that evidence seriously within philosophy as a kind of starting point. Now, I think that there's an objection that one could raise here. And the objection is that, uh, well, maybe mathematicians aren't using explanation in the same way that we use explanation when we talk in philosophy or that in the same way that maybe scientists use explanation when they're doing science. So for instance, you could think that when mathematicians use explanatory talk, it's really code for some kind of aesthetic talk. So what they're saying is that one proof is more beautiful than another, not that there's anything more explanatory going on. Or maybe they just mean cognitive salience of a certain kind. So they mean that one mathematical proof or one sort of mathematical relationship gives you a kind of aha moment that another one doesn't or another another potential is that what you're learning about when you're or what they're talking about when they're talking about explanation is certain kinds of inferential connections that are important for whatever reason maybe not because of cognitive salience but maybe because of the role they play in mathematics and explanation is just a way of getting at those inferential connections but there's nothing um there's no, no sort of continuity between the way that mathematicians talk about explanation and the way that we talk about explanation. 
So Lang dismisses this kind of worry. He says, um, and I think this is broadly right, but I'm going to build on it. He says, no such suspicion is seriously entertained with regard to scientific explanation, and we should demand some reason why mathematical explanation deserves to be regarded differently. So it's not like when we hear scientists talking about explanation, we suspect that they're using explanation talk in a way that diverges from the way that we think of it in philosophy. We're just willing to take at face value that they're talking about explanation in roughly the same way that we are so that we can have a meaningful discussion between science and philosophy. And Lang's point is that unless we're given some reason to think that mathematics and science or mathematical explanation and scientific explanation are really different kinds of things uh, in, some, in some way, then we shouldn't, um, we should sort of have the same kind of face value attitude toward mathematical explanation. As I said, I think we can take this a little bit further. If we actually look at some of the things that mathematicians say, I think we have to be extremely uncharitable to interpret them as saying the kind of aesthetic or cognitive salience or inferential connection type thing. So here's an example from Timothy Gowers, who's a, um, a field medalist, fields medalist in mathematics, who is one of the few mathematicians who sort of openly uh, theorizes about mathematics in a kind of philosophical way. So he's quite good uh, for as someone to um, sort of pick out statements about mathematics from. And here's what he says about mathematics. He says, some branches of mathematics derive their appeal from an abundance of mysterious phenomena that demand explanation. So he's using this explanation talk explicitly. And he says, these might be striking numerical coincidences suggesting a deep relationship between areas that appear on the surface have nothing to do with each other, arguments which prove interesting results by brute force and therefore do not satisfactorily explain them. And he goes on to outline some other examples. I think it would be I think it's hard to read this in this kind of aesthetic sense or this cognitive salient sense. It really looks to be saying exactly the same kinds of things that scientists say about explanation. Look, sometimes you've got these uh, things that look too coincidental to be mere coincidences and there's got to be some deeper relationship behind them. And sometimes you have these sort of brute force proofs that don't seem to be satisfactory in this kind of explanatory sense. And we make similar claims in science. Sometimes they just seem to be sort of facts that are brute force or brute facts. We want a deeper explanation. This kind of talk strikes me as exactly the same kind of talk that we have in science. And I think it would just, I think it's just very difficult to interpret at least this kind of talk, which we see in places in mathematics as being not about explanation in the sense that we mean it in other areas of philosophy and other areas of science. All right, that's all I'm going to say about the first premise. This brings me to the second premise. So this is the premise that relates to the backing theory of explanation. So as I mentioned, the backing theory of explanation is this idea that explanations are representations. And in order for a representation to count as an explanation, it has to provide information about dependence relations connecting parts of the world. Why should we believe this picture of explanation? I think that this is definitely up for grabs. I think that you can deny this picture of explanation and I'll circle back to that later on. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you two reasons to accept it. One of them comes from sort of general considerations about explanation. And the other one is aimed at nominalists who are engaged in this debate in particular. So it's a kind of move within the dialectic that is aimed to put nominalists in a, on the back foot. So the more general point here is that the backing conception is closely connected to what's sometimes called the ontic con conception of explanation. It's not entirely clear to me what the connection is. There hasn't been a great deal of work looking at the connection. What you tend to find is people in the philosophy of science talking about the ontic conception and people more in philosophy of mind and metaphysics talking about the backing conception, but they seem to say very similar kinds of things. So here's Juhar Saatzi talking about the ontic conception of explanation. He says, explanatory power derives from stating some relevant worldly facts, objective causal or mechanistic facts or nomological facts or statistical relevance relations or symmetries or whatever ontic structures can bear an objective relationship of explanatory relevance to the explanandum. So this sounds very similar to the backing conception. I think that they may just be the same view, but at the very least, it looks like the ontic conception implies the backing conception. So if you accept the ontic picture of explanation, then you should accept at least this 
um, backing conception is a kind of necessary component of the ontic picture. You should think that there are these relations of dependence between bits bits of stuff in the world that underpin the explanation. The explanatory power comes from giving you that kind of information about relations between things in the world. So the, the point here is that the backing conception is going to enjoy whatever mo motivations are enjoyed by the ontic conception. And I should say that the ontic conception is quite prominent in the philosophy of science. It's one of the main theories of explanation. And the reason for that, comes back to this um, relationship or background in the debate concerning uh, scientific realism and explanation. So as I said, scientific realists are very much up for explanation. They think that there's a strong connection between explanation and ontology, but different theories of explanation are going to allow you to keep hold of that connection between explanation and ontology to varying degrees. So some accounts of explanation that you adopt, like highly instrumentalist or pragmatic accounts of explanation of the kind that Van Frassen offered, for instance, don't allow you to forge a strong connection between explanation and ontology. The ontic conception, however, allows you to forge this powerful connection. In fact, of the theories of explanation that there are, it forges the strongest connection between explanation and ontology. So if you're a scientific realist, you have a strong motivation to accept the ontic conception because it joins explanation to ontology in the manner that underpins and motivates scientific realism in the first place. So if scientific realism is this common ground in the debate between Platonists and nominalists, then both of them have a motivation to accept the ontic conception and with it, the backing conception, which falls out of it. So that's the first consideration in favor of the backing conception. It sort of comes out of the ontic conception. The second consideration, and this is aimed at nominalists in particular, is that nominalists uh, least the sort of most recent batch of nominalists really shouldn't give up the ontic conception or should be very careful about doing this. And that's because by their own lights, one of the strongest arguments against the indispensability argument relies on the ontic conception. So remember I introduced the indispensability argument, the explanatory indispensability argument, and that indispensability argument draws on the explanatory power of mathematics in order to make a case for the existence of mathematical objects. And what a number of nominalists have argued, uh, so most recently we've got Juha Satsi, Robert Knowles, and um, I can't pronounce this person's first name, so I'm just going to say the last name, Korakowski. They're, they've all argued that the indispensability argument fails because the ontic conception of explanation is true. And the basic idea here, and I'm going to put this in, in like fairly tendentious terms, the actual cases that these authors make are much more sophisticated and sensitive than the version that I'm about to give you. But the basic idea is that if you think of mathematical objects as the Platonist does, as existing in a non-spatiotemporal way, as being non-causal, um, it looks like there's a metaphysical gap between mathematical objects and the physical universe. And this metaphysical gap poses a problem for an ontic picture of explanation. So the ontic picture of explanation is supposed to be this picture like the backing picture, which appeals to dependence relations between things in the world in order to underpin explanations. If mathematical objects are abstract entities independent of the physical realm, then the worry is that there's a metaphysical gap between those objects and th the physical world, which makes it difficult to see how they could do the kind of explanatory work that the ontic conception demands of them. They're sort of too metaphysically isolated to be able to push and pull the physical world around in the way that the ontic conception demands. Now, there are other conceptions of explanation. And if you move to another conception of explanation, this worry might not be as pressing. There are also other pictures of realism. And so you might wonder what happens if you move to a different picture of realism. But if we keep focused on Platonism and the ontic conception, then we have a kind of prima facie case for retaining the ontic conception if you're a nominalist, precisely because it's a powerful weapon against the indispensability argument and against Platonism. So just to summarize the case I've made for the second premise, if we reject the ontic conception, then we lose a connection between ontology and explanation. And that connection is important for scientific realism. And we also lose a strong argument in favor of nominalism. And so there's, an, there's a motivation for nominalists to accept the kind of theory of explanation that would make my argument work. <laughs> 
Now it's worth pausing here because I think something kind of uh, interesting arises. I'm going to frame it as an objection, but I think the objection turns up something kind of interesting. So here's the objection. I've said that my, my argument relies on this ontic or backing conception. And you might think, well, look, I don't really care about the ontic backing conception. I don't think it's right. I've got some other picture of explanation. And so it's a kind of weak argument for Platonism that I've given you because it's hostage to the fortunes of an, of an account of explanation. And of course, there are other accounts of explanation. So I think that's right. I mean, I think that the argument I've given you is absolutely hostage to a particular picture of explanation. But I think the indispensability argument is also hostage to uh, a picture of explanation. And I think the indisp indispensability argument really relies on the ontic or backing conception being false in order for it to work. And that's precisely because you do have this metaphysical isolation between mathematical and physical objects, if you're a Platonist at least. And that metaphysical isolation makes it very hard to see how there could be an ontic or backing conception of explanation. And so if you're going to put forward the indispensability argument, the most sensible thing to do is to adopt a theory of explanation that's not one of these ontic or backing conceptions. And in fact, if you look at the kinds of pictures of explanation that Platonists adopt, they do tend to be um, departed, they do tend to depart from ontic or backing conceptions in some in some way. So I think that my argument is no worse than the indispensability argument in this respect. I think they're both, they're both relying on particular assumptions about how explanation works in order to make a case for the existence of uh, mathematical objects in order to make a case for mathematical Platonism. But I think it's worth pausing here because I think what this shows you is that in fact, the case for Platonism is a bit stronger in general in virtue of having this other argument that I've put forward. Because either the ontic conception, the backing conception is correct in general, or it's not. So either it works for all explanations or it doesn't. If it does work for all explanations, uh, if it is the, the right theory of all explanations, then the indispensability argument fails for the reason that I've already outlined. You've got this gap and don't, it's hard to see how to bridge the gap. But in that situation, my argument goes through because you need the back. If you've got the backing conception, you've got intramathematical explanations. Well, then you're going to have the, um, the the materials you need to make a case for the existence of mathematical objects in the way that I'm suggesting. If the ontic or backing conception is not true in general, then the ex the indispensability argument doesn't fail, but mine probably does right? Because there's a simple way to resist it, which is to say, well, however mathematical explanation works, which is say explanation purely within mathematics, um, it's not going to work via this sort of ontic or, or, or backing conception. So it's going to be one of the exceptions to the ontic or backing conception, one of the places in which it fails. So what I think this shows you is that the case for Platonism, you can sort of make a case for Platonism based on the, whether the ontic conception is right or not. And in fact, you know, almost by dilemma, you can make a case for, for Platonism. But more importantly, I think this shows that the argument I've put forward is genuinely a new argument for Platonism because what it, it really relies in some sense on the failure of the indispensability argument and it succeeds when the indispensability argument fails. So they're not really just ways of repackaging the same argument. All right, so this brings me to the third premise. And this um, third premise, uh, as we'll recall, is this conditional claim saying that if you've got intramathematical explanations and you've got the backing conception of explanation, then you should believe in the existence of mathematical objects. And I think this relies on two assumptions, this premise. The first premise is that dependence relations are existence entailing. So what that means is if X depends on Y, then X and Y both exist. The second thing it relies on is that the only, that only dependence relations between mathematical entities are fit to back intramathematical explanations. So for instance, dependence relations between, um, you know, peanuts, other pick your favorite concrete objects, those things are not going to be fit to back into mathematical explanations. So it has to be mathematical entities and their connection that's doing this kind of work. Now this, I'm going to take these in turn. The first assumption I think is built into the backing or the ontic conception. 
these pictures of explanation are really saying that explanation is a matter of dependence relations between things in the world, between parts of the world. And unless you think that there are parts of the world that can't exist, or that, sorry, if you think that there are parts of the world that don't exist, then you should probably think that there are these dependence relations connecting parts of the world and that those parts of the world exist. So I think that the, I mean, to put this point another way, I think that the ontic conception is called the ontic conception precisely because it presupposes that there are dependence relations and the dependence relations exist and they connect things and those things exist, right? That's what the ontic part of that theory is doing. And similarly, the backing conception is really uh, assuming something similar as the ontic conception in that way. But look, I think you can deny this. And I think people have denied this. And I think that the uh, at least one prominent class of um, views in this area, at least uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, um, the, the nonists. So people like Richard Routley, who do in fact maintain that there are non-existent entities that stand in relations to one another. And in fact, Routley thought that um, there are causal relations between things that don't exist. So I think one of the examples he gives uh, involves uh, phlogiston. And I think he thinks that, look, phlogiston, you know, okay, maybe it, it doesn't exist, but phlogiston genuinely causes things to burn. Maybe not anything that exists to burn, but there are causal relations between phlogiston and things burning. Um, and those causal relations are there. They're just connecting things that don't exist. So I think you can go this way, but I think that what that nonism or something like it is the price of giving up the existence entailment of dependence relations. And it's not clear to me that a nominalist is going to be happy with this um, metaphysical picture at the end of the day. So I think a nominalist is going to be just as uncomfortable about dependence relations between non-existent entities as they are about dependence relations between mathematical entities that exist, particularly when we take we keep in mind that the kinds of relations that we're talking about are the relations that are implicated in explanation. And so these are things like causation and grounding and constitution and nomic dependence. And so you end up as a nominalist thinking that non-existent entities are constituting each other or causing each other or grounding each other, depending on exactly how you think the dependence in the case of mathematical explanation works. So this is to say that in some sense, I don't have an argument against nonism, but uh, if you are a nominalist and you take this way out of the argument, that's where you're gonna end up. So this leads me to this other assumption, which is that only dependence relations between mathematical entities are fit to back into mathematical explanations. So my, my basis for this assumption is simply that it's unclear what else could do this work. An intramathematical explanation is an explanation of one mathematical fact in terms of another. These explanations only quantify over mathematical objects. And so it only seems that these mathematical objects are explanatorily relevant. And so it's only dependence relations between these objects that could be the kinds of dependence relations that uh, mathematical explanations are giving us information about. So, you know, insofar as intramathematical explanations are giving us information about dependence relations between objects, it's hard to see what else they could be giving you information about except relations between mathematical objects. Okay, so that rounds out my case in favor of the argument. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to identify some ways out and just note the implications of taking these ways out. So one way out is to accept Platonism. That is to think that mathematical objects exist and uh, they exist because we need them for to make sense of how explanation works in, in mathematics. That is in fact the way out that I take. Uh, but there are two others. Oh, well, there's three others. One of them is to accept nonism. As I said, if you're a nonist, then you can uh, actually accept the backing and ontic conception. You can accept that there are intramathematical explanations um, and you, you just deny that any of that has ontological consequences. Assuming you don't want to be a nonist though, you can also adopt what I'm going to call non-backing nominalism. So the non-backing nominalist denies the backing, the backing or the ontic conception either in whole or in part. So they're either going to deny that it works for all explanations. Um, well, 
that that's exact that that's it so i shouldn't say either in whole or in part they are in fact going to deny that it works for all explanations which means that there are some explanations that it doesn't work for and uh, in particular they're going to think that it doesn't work for intramathematical explanations so maybe perfectly fine for explanations relating things that we talk about in science but no good when it comes to explanations within mathematics the third option is what I'm going to call sceptical nominalism. And the sceptical nominalist denies that there are any intramathematical explanations. And the challenge, as we saw there, is to navigate your way through naturalism and to come up with a way of being a nominalist that preserves a kind of naturalistic um, temperament. That might mean restricting naturalism or making naturalism so that um, it, it doesn't, it sort of moves away from explanation like doesn't apply to explanation or something like that i don't exactly know how to do that there's lots of different flavors of naturalism out there and so maybe there's a way to make that kind of picture work i don't have any arguments against these forms of nominalism but what i'm going to do is i'm going to identify um, that no matter which option you take here you're giving up something that's precious to somebody. So the backing conception of explanation is extremely popular. There's a, a list of people, a, a incomplete list of people who have explicitly endorsed it uh, in for all explanations and not just explicitly endorsed it for all explanations, but have claimed that it is um, the, the best account of explanations. And so it's the one we have the most reason to adopt. In, uh, in his book, Depth, I think Michael, Streb Michael Strevens provides a fairly detailed case for a kind of backing theory of explanation. And the basic idea is that you run into, in order to restrict the space of representations down to only those representations that we want to say are explanations, you really need some kind of dependence relation between things in the world to do that kind of work. Otherwise, you just can't control the space of representations well enough. Intramathematical explanations, you can give those up, but there are lots of people who accept the existence of those things, uh, including the people that I've listed who've done that corpus analysis, but also a range of philosophers. This is just the most recent batch, uh, but you know, going back to people like Steiner, who accepted the existence of these kinds of explanations and even further. And of course, it looks like you have to have something to say to mathematicians at that point. The last one is you can give up nominalism, as I said, but there are lots of nominalists. And so lots of those people are not going to be happy either. And as I said, a nonist can avoid negotiating on these things. And I think it's intriguing that nonism may be the price of nominalism, given how unpopular it is in metaphysics. I think that uh, Routley and Priest may be the only two that have provided sort of full-throated defenses of nonism, at least in recent times. I, I mean, it's important to keep in mind that nonism is not the same as the kind of Minongianism that we find in, in Meinong's work, but it's sort of in the same ballpark in some sense. All right, so I'm just gonna finish off by summarizing. So what I've done is I've given you a new argument for Platonism. I think it is genuinely a new argument. It doesn't rely on indispensability considerations. And in fact, it looks like it, it will fail in some, some respects once the indispensability argument gets off the ground and vice versa. Uh, if the argument fails, then it does so because of because either the backing conception of explanation is wrong or because there are no intramathematical explanations or because, or because nonism is true. So whatever the outcome, I think the argument promises to teach us something new. And that's why I think that even if you don't buy the argument, even if you don't think the argument motivates Platonism, trying to work out where the argument fails and what it means when the argument fails is still an important and interesting thing to do. Okay, that finishes it off. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you so much, Sam. That was extremely interesting. So let's uh, thank Sam the, for the first time and then we will go to the questions. Uh, let me stop the recording now.